Peter, good afternoon, early evening. Lovely to see you. You too, Paul. Hi, everyone. Um, so we were talking offline, but um, I wanted to just start with some of the um, emerging information that we're learning about the disease itself. Um, and we were talking about the fact that it, um, we presumed that it was a kind of a traditional respiratory ailment in the same way that we think about influenza or flus. And in fact, that it may be something that has some quite different characteristics and that may both explain death, explain risk, but also help think about pathways to treatments and interventions, both from a vaccine point of view, but also from an amelioration point of view. So would you tell us a little bit about what's been emerging in recent days or weeks about our greater understanding of what COVID is? Sure. So we know, of course, that the virus is a respiratory pathogen, meaning we mostly ingest it into our respiratory tract from either inhaling a droplet or um, contact in our mouth and into our respiratory tract. And that's the place that the virus attacks. Um, and we also know that in the cases where it becomes really severe or fatal, that it's typically as much or more about the body's reaction to the infection um, as it is to the infection itself. And that's why we tend to see this situation where people maybe start to get some symptoms. And after about a week or so of having kind of cold and flu-like symptoms and being hit pretty hard, might feel a little bit better. Then they develop a cough and can really go downhill quickly. And what's happening there is this kind of massive inflammatory response in the lungs where they start to fill up with fluid and inflammatory material and get heavy. And then you start you know, having trouble oxygenating and things like that. So that's largely actually about this kind of, you'll sometimes hear terms like cytokine storm. Cytokines are these kinds of inflammatory particles um, that flood the body in response to a new pathogen. Um, so we've seen that and that's interesting because it opens up some possibilities for treatment of severe infection that might be not necessarily antivirals, which we don't have yet, but things that could blunt that immune or inflammatory response. And many of those things are tried in patients who are in intensive treatment units and things like that. What's emerged over um, in recent weeks and even in recent days is that you know, this virus continues to surprise us and, uh, and we see the effects of COVID-19 um, illness in many other systems of the body as well. So early on, we heard that actually, you know, it's not just respiratory symptoms. A lot of people are having gastrointestinal symptoms early on in the virus that some people lose their sense of smell. Um, we're seeing a phenomenon where people have neurologic um, sequelae of infection. And it could be that even in some cases, there could be some longer term neurologic effects of having had COVID-19. We've seen some issues with blood clotting. And when blood clots go into the lungs in particular, they can be quite dangerous. And then this week, there was this really uh, alarming notice that was sent out to GPs across the country that there's been a cluster of cases in children with kind of a multi-system inflammatory response to get really sick. GI, circulatory, respiratory, neurologic systems all involved. And most of those kids tested positive for the virus or antibodies for past infection. So there appears to be a syndrome that's similar to something we call Kawasaki's disease in kids that's very severe, that is, um, that is sort of multi-system and is related to COVID-19. And that I've not seen described before these kinds of isolated reports. And now this, this notice that went out to GPs, which is just saying, you gotta watch out for people who are pretty sick with other non-respiratory symptoms, especially in kids, that there might be something happening here. It's very humbling. Well, yeah. and, and were that to become widespread or beyond just you know 12 cases or something where i think at this point it's enough to alert people but not enough for us to be in widespread panic mode but if this begins to emerge as something to watch that will be that will change the dynamics of lockdowns it will change back to school i mean lockdown lifting and back to school because the, all of these things will will be I mean, right now, the one thing as adults that we have up to now been very relieved about is that of all the many concerns we have in the world, the one thing we don't is our kids. Yeah. 
That's exactly right. Um, and, you know, I don't think this is going to become a massive sort of epidemic of this inflammatory syndrome, but as you say, um, fatalities in children have been very sporadic and isolated. And so as we see more of this, um, it becomes even harder to sort of countenance potentially exposing our children through returns to schools and things, um, you know, like that. Early on, there were some people who were saying, um, in good faith, maybe it's not bad um, if children just get exposed and it helps to build more immunity in the population and they're safe anyways, um, and they're not. Uh, and, you know, sure, the risk isn't nearly as high as it is for the elderly, but who wants to take a one or 2% chance with their own, you know, child? Not very many of us. So let's go from that to a, sort of a more positive thing and then we'll, we'll come back to care homes, which is, is more, more devastating. But um, one of the things Anthony Fauci was saying yesterday about these new, more um, interesting understandings about what the disease does is it also helps give us pathways to, to prevention and to treatments and to vaccines. So, Tell us a little bit about, I know you're very close to what's happening in Oxford and you, what, you watch the vaccine stuff and the treatment stuff. So tell, tell us the, your latest takes there. Sure, we do vaccines quickly and then treatment. So we've talked a lot about the vaccine being tried here in Oxford. It's been getting a ton of press the last week, um, uh, really all over the world, actually. I've been getting calls from Japan and, and, and lots of other places to, to talk about this, um, um, Saudi Arabia, et cetera. So this is a vaccine that was already developed. It's a kind of inactive virus from chimpanzees that doesn't affect humans and they've sort of plugged in the genetic code of the coronavirus spike into it. Um, so that started trials in humans last week. One thing that emerged over the weekend is I had mentioned that they were doing this really kind of super quick animal study um, before they started in humans that was mostly safety. What they found in the study which was 16 rhesus macaques, rhesus monkeys are the monkeys that are thought to be closest to humans biologically. Um, uh, you know, um, what they found was that actually in 16, I mean, this cohort of 16 monkeys that they actually did have protection from exposure to a very high level of virus. So it does seem to have efficacy in monkeys in a very small cohort. So there's a lot of confidence. And, and last week, um, some of the, the leaders of this study, including Sarah Gilbert said, we think this works. We're gonna know this works by September. We're already starting to make a million doses of vaccine. So that's kind of awesome. Uh, at the same time, it's very enthusiastic. And I think I'd still be cautious about that. There's so much that we don't know. We don't know about safety. It's just now being given in humans. If we do a good enough job of flattening the curve, the 500 um, people that are being enrolled initially in this trial may not be enough because what you have to do is get enough people, hopefully in the control arm, who actually get COVID-19 that you can show a difference. Um, and if suddenly all the cases go away because we're social distancing, it makes it very difficult to kind of prove that. And you need more and more and more people. Um, but it's a glimmer of hope and, and, and something to be excited about. It's great that it's happening here in the UK. The UK government's been a great leader in investing in vaccine development and vaccine scale up. Um, hopefully that's not gonna be too nationalistic. This needs to be for the world wherever it comes from. But hey, some, some great news. I'm still saying 18 months because I think it's more realistic, but I'd love to be surprised and see something sooner. On the treatment side, um, two things to note. One is that there's this antiviral drug called remdesivir uh, made by Gilia that was developed previously and tested for Ebola. It didn't work very well. Seemed to maybe work here. Uh, the first proper randomized controlled trial that I know of, which was U.S. federally funded, um, where people were randomized with severe infection, randomized to either get this drug or a placebo, just closed. And the U.S. government's supposed to announce the results. Gilead said, we can't tell you the results, but it reached its primary endpoint and we're pleased and we've suspended trading of our stock today, which all suggests that the early news on that will be good that it has some positive effect. So I don't have the results, but um, we're optimistically and cautiously awaiting hopefully some positive news that that would be the first effective antiviral treatment for um, SARS-CoV-2 or the, the virus that causes COVID-19. So let, fingers let me crossed. Jump in on, let me jump in on, rem, on remdesivir. They suspended the stock today. That's my understanding. They suspended trading this morning yeah. On, yeah. on opening, yeah. yeah. Um, which is the same time they announced that the US government is supposed to be announcing the results of this study. Yeah. So, so you don't really, 
suspend trading in your stock for bad news? Do you? Is that? I mean, is is it conceivable that they say there's a massive flop and therefore you know people are going to plunge out of the out of the out of the company? Is that is that what happens? I uh, I don't know. If, I don't know. the 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 word from Gilead sounded more positive. Right. Um, like we can't say anything, but we're very pleased with what we've heard. Um, wow. So. Wow. We'll see. I mean, we don't know. The, we don't know the answer, but um, you know, there's been some reports in uncontrolled studies where you have a bunch of people in ICU. You give them all remdesivir. Their viral load seems to go down. A lot of them get a little bit better. Get off ventilators. You say, ah, oh, it kind of looks like it works, but I have nothing to compare it to. Right. Now we have a study that actually did have a comparison group, and so if that's a positive result, that's very important and very persuasive, and um, and that could lead to this, um, uh, you know, actually maybe getting emergency approval and things. So I don't want to get ahead of myself, but fingers crossed that we might get some some news there. Um, that's probably the biggest news. The other thing is that there's now a big trial. I was just on. Um, uh, on the phone with some folks at Johns Hopkins, um, and they've got 1,500 people enrolled in the trial using that convalescent plasma, meaning the, the plasma from people who have recovered from infection to essentially give their antibodies. Um, and, and that's also looking quite promising. That won't be necessarily a cure, but can be a, an important temporizing therapy in a number of cases. So um, two, two glimmers of hope that might help us bring this under control and start to save some lives. You are usually, you know, the person at the end of a half an hour with you, I feel, because you're sober-minded and balanced, I always sort of feel slightly deflated. These are, this, I'm so far so good. It's 13 minutes in and I'm feeling... I'll, I'll try to crush your hopes before the hour is out, Paul. <laughs> Thank you. So Dominica Reagan has a question, which is, with other vaccines, how close a relationship is there between effectiveness in monkeys and humans? With oncology, there's a very poor relationship between what works in animals and humans, but do we have other reasons to be encouraged that what works in monkeys works in humans? It varies a lot, and we don't know necessarily a lot about how this particular virus behaves in rhesus macaques because it's new for everybody. With other respiratory viruses, it tends to be quite similar, and rhesus macaques are often used as um, the kind of animal model um, because they're so close to us biologically. Um, this is, I would say it's encouraging news, but it's by no means a slam dunk. There's so much that we don't know. And it was only 16 monkeys, I think in the entire trial, and it was done over like two weeks. So this is nowhere near the level of kind of rigor of animal testing that we would normally see in a vaccine. Um, so we should take it very cautiously. Um, I think, and, and, and say we're still very early. It would not be surprising at all if there's some kind of hiccup with this trial, that it doesn't work as well as we thought, that there is some kind of safety concern. You know, we got to remember, right, we're giving this to healthy people, and it wouldn't be the first time that in the setting of an epidemic or a pandemic, you know, a vaccine has been rushed out that turned out to actually be harmful. You know, there were... Um, the swine, there was a swine flu epidemic in the late 1970s and the vaccine was rushed out at that time and it turned out to quite commonly cause um, a, a paralyzing condition called Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is an autoimmune thing affecting the spinal cord. And quite a few people temporarily or permanently became paralyzed um, as a result of this vaccine who were previously healthy. So all of it is about risk and benefit um, in terms of safety and efficacy and we're walking a really fine line here. So um, I'm you know, excited to hear some, some good news, but we do have to have some, uh, you know, some real caution here. Okay, um, coming now to the announcements made today, it seems as though there's a big lot of activity on COVID today, but uh, in relation to care homes and the UK updating their numbers, uh, again, you were saying that their numbers have been adjusted up by some 4,000 uh, there or thereabouts people, which on the current numbers, if you know we've crested 20,000, you're talking about you know, a 20% increase in the total number of deaths, which is an astonishing number. Um, and we've often spoken about how, uh, you know, COVID being a mirror and a magnifier, you know, we, we neglect the most vulnerable and we don't count them. You know, there's nothing more denying of your humanity than not being counted and being rendered invisible. And this is yeah. that compounded with death. So tell us a little bit about this, this, this finding and, more importantly, you've been speaking about this for some time, so there isn't really a big headline here other than the shocking loss of human life. 
But the consequence for this in terms of does it change going forward, um, I'd also be interested in speaking, um, hearing your views on. Yeah, so the this is ongoing, uh, the, the presser that's ongoing, uh, but just a few minutes ago was announced, essentially the upward revision of the death toll in the UK from about 22,000 to about 26,000. It was like 3,840 deaths or so in care homes that were added to the toll. Now, that doesn't mean that this all happened yesterday. Obviously, this has been over a matter of weeks, but they just weren't being counted before. You know, so much of everything that's been reported, both cases and deaths, have been only in hospitals. Um, and that was for a variety of reasons, none of them nefarious, I don't think. Um, with tests, it was because of rationing, because there haven't been enough tests, um, and there just haven't been systems to try to necessarily count and confirm everything. So we've known for some time that we weren't counting care home deaths, we weren't counting community deaths, and that for a long time we weren't counting suspected deaths, people who may have died but didn't have access to a test, and so it wasn't actually confirmed to be a COVID-19 death. Um, uh, it was just a question mark. And, um, and then you go back, as was done in New York last week, and say, actually, look at all of these other people. We're pretty sure they had all the, all the hallmarks of COVID-19 disease. They just never got a test. Let's put them in account as well. So we've long estimated that um, we're undercounting the number of deaths in this country by about 50%. Um, approximately. And, and this sort of underscores that we're just getting closer to an accurate toll. Um, and it, it is sobering because it's just such an astonishing number. Um, and it really, I think, highlights the fact that in our response, we've really neglected um, the, the care home sector and really focused on the kind of traditional medical facilities, and especially hospitals, building emergency hospitals, but not recognizing that actually, even though we know the most vulnerable are the elderly and care homes are by definition, places where our most medically vulnerable members of society are all living in close proximity in like a stationary cruise ship, um, that we were not doing all that we could to protect them and to protect the workers that are caring for them. The problem with not counting them is not obviously just that this happened, but imagine if we had started, if we had been counting all along when there were a thousand deaths in care homes, this would have been a scandal and a crisis and there would have been more attention paid to it. So we've seen a lot more investment in trying to get PPE to care home workers, um, in trying to find safe ways to get the elderly out of care homes if they had another place to go, like with family members, et cetera. And we're doing this so belatedly now because attention has been paid to it. One of the things that I've really seen is that, you know, the government, they haven't always made the right decision. Maybe nobody will. They do respond to pressure. And that's why many of us have tried to keep up pressure where we feel like it's important to do so. Um, but without these kinds of this kind of information, this was a big blind spot, I think, for everybody. And it's just really a shame um, that it's, it's, it's happened this way. Um, you know, I read this morning that about a third of care homes in the UK have COVID-19 cases, have essentially, you know, sort of outbreaks and have the potential to kind of spread. So we unfortunately haven't seen, um, haven't seen the end of this. It could be quite devastating. You know, I want to ask you a question that's been asked in multiple different ways, but I'm, I'm trying to, you know, right now there are these sort of <clears throat> entirely artificial, in my view, debates between health and life and, and economic growth and weighing up, you know, how long we keep a lockdown and the damage it does to the economy and, and, and the consequences for it. And in some ways, those are real tensions and their real consequences and shrinking economies also affect the most vulnerable uh, and can lead to rise in excess mortalities there. So we shouldn't be glib about this debate. Um, I want to talk, ask you about a second wave. Mm -hmm. And, you know, purportedly in the Spanish flu, the second wave was much worse than the first. And if the second wave happens, you know, in winter here, uh, you know, and we're not properly equipped for it, that will be, that will be, I think, very worrying. Now, how low does the infection as a percentage of the population have to get? And how sealed off does your country have to be from people in other countries in order to be sure that you will not get a second wave? And is it... And, and put differently, 
is there not just something mathematical about the inevitability of a second wave? Um, and what can we do to stave that off, if anything? Yeah, this is a tough one. Um, when you talk about opening back up, we know pretty well from 100 years of public health experience, from what we're able to model with some confidence, um, that early and decisive action, particularly on so-called non-pharmaceutical interventions, aka social distancing, is really important and that the earlier and more effectively you do it, the more lives you save, right? We could have potentially averted 90% of the deaths so far in the US and the UK had the lockdown started two weeks earlier. Those are things that we feel pretty confident about. What we really don't know much about is how exactly you open up safely um, and, and, and what it takes to do that. And what you're seeing now all around the world in Asia and some European countries and a few US states are all these little natural experiments and sort of how to do that. Some places are opening garden centers, some are opening schools, some are opening certain kinds of shops, some are social distancing in different ways. Um, and, it, it, and that reflects, I think, the lack of a, of a playbook on how to do this. It's going to be really important that we try to learn from all of these things. And so another call I was on today was actually looking at putting together a database so we can track the exact interventions and easing up in different places and then track those things so that we can then use that to improve our modeling and sort of say, easing up this in this way you know, might affect the, the R naught, you know, the replicability kind of infectivity factor by a certain amount. And that helps us understand what to do best. And, you know, the UK, we're watching all of these things and the government is sort of looking to see what works and doesn't work elsewhere. Um, and hopefully that will inform our strategy here because we're not ready yet. And, and we know that. We do know from the countries that have tried this is, is that it's incredibly fragile. And that, again, the more people are moving around and in proximity and in contact with one another, um, the, the higher that R0 is going to go and the greater the risk of spread. So you, to your question of how low is enough, what, what level of infection is the threshold below which it's safe to open up? I mean, the answer is essentially zero if you want it to be safe. But the question is, how low is safe enough where we kind of balance this? And, and I think the answer is low enough that you have the ability to control the spread, to monitor and control the spread through regular shoe, double, epi, shoe, shoe leather epidemiology, that you can test everybody who needs testing, that you think you can detect most of the cases, that you can trace most of their contacts, and that you can safely isolate those people who need to be isolated so that you can manage this and prevent it from escaping. Because what we know is that when the virus escapes and it's driving and you're back on that exponential curve, um, particularly when you're kind of with this two week lag time, it's so hard to catch up. And that's why the, the fifth so-called test in the UK government strategy for how to ease lockdown is we need to be sure that we're not risking another exponential surge, which was the kind of second wave um, scenario. Um, so the answer is the, the threshold is gonna depend on how much capacity you have to test and trace and isolate. So Germany, has been able to start opening up a little bit with what was still a fairly high level of infections. They were still reporting close to a couple of thousand new infections a day when they started easing a little bit, but they have massive hospital capacity. They're doing home-based care. They're testing hundreds of thousands of people per day. They had systems in place where they felt like they could do that. Now, they may be having to tighten back down a little bit, but that's very different from other places where you may want cases to be down in the tens or hundreds a day, um, because beyond that, you would overwhelm any kind of contact tracing system. So um, that's my answer, and that's why it's so important that we're investing now in building up the capabilities to test and trace and isolate. We haven't talked enough about isolation, um, but what does that actually mean, right? If I'm sick with COVID-19 and I isolate myself in my house, I'm putting my whole family at risk, right? And this has been our standard practice. Unless you're sick enough to get hospitalized, you try to isolate yourself in the home, but the, the reality is you're putting your family members at risk and there's a pretty good chance that some of your house, say four people on average in a household are all gonna get infected. The proper way to isolate is to have a place for people who are positive 
but not sick enough to be in the hospital can go and ride out the storm isolation facilities. These could be um, unused hotels. These could be other sort of residential facilities or dormitories. We know that only 10% of people need to be hospitalized. If we could get the other 90% of cases out of their households and safely isolated, that will also really help us to interrupt the spread. And that's something that is hardly being talked about at all. And I don't quite get that because we got a lot of empty hotels and we have a lot of empty residential facilities um, in, in, uh, in Massachusetts, which has partnered with Partners in Health to, to develop this army of contact tracers, which has been really fun to see with a lot of my old colleagues. They've also repurposed a bunch of facilities and are now having these kinds of non-medical isolation facilities for people who test positive. That's smart. Um, so sorry to give you a long and no, no, uncertain that's... answer, but these are the kinds of things that we need to be doing. The more of that that we're doing, the easier it'll be for us to get out without risking things. If we're not doing any of that stuff, it won't work. And if we're not testing, we won't even know. We'll be having silent spread for weeks and weeks. That's when you risk having the second right. spike be worse than the first. Right. So potentially every single piece of harm and collective suffering that we've been through through this lockdown will be for naught if we reemerge without the ability to test, contact trace, properly isolate and then i would suggest when people come from abroad some period of both testing and quarantining because one of the other things that i've been hitting my palm against my forehead on is it seems that the uk has had a sort of slightly open border policy totally open and when asked about this what the response has been was that um number one it's not screening at airports is not perfect. You know, you might be asymptomatic. And so just temperature screening won't catch everybody. Okay, fine. You could also do rapid testing um, or you can quarantine people. And number two, essentially, there's so much community spread in the UK already that people coming back in are just a drop in the ocean. So it's almost not even worth it. That's basically what they've said. We've done so badly with everything else that this is not the big problem. Let's not worry about that. Um, which is crazy to me. I mean, the easiest way to solve this, at the, at the very least, temperature screening, you know, it's not rocket science. Every single country in Africa does this and has been doing it for a long time. And the second thing is just to say, if you are coming into the country, you need to self-quarantine and be in a place where we can reach you and trace you for 14 days, right. wherever you come from, because the infection is everywhere. Yeah. And then you know if you want to travel, that's just going to be part of the deal. It's happening a lot of other places. So it's a little bit inexplicable that we're not doing that. It wouldn't take a lot um, to, um, to have a call center of people who are tracking people coming in and maybe calling them once a day and asking them to take their temperature at home and following up. Yeah. So yes, I yeah. agree with you. And I the mean, answer to your yeah. question is, will it all be for naught if we can't do these things? Could be. I mean, so, lockdowns yeah. are not solving the problem. They're buying us time. Yeah. And are we using that time effectively to build a long-term uh, containment strategy? Yeah. Question. Well, um, I mean, two things there, that, that if you'd locked down two weeks earlier, you could have uh, averted 90% of the deaths. Um, you know, even if that number is off by an additional week and there's no reason in epi epidemiological models to suspect that it is, uh, the, the 30 days of inaction that, that we have seen in this country and others, um, there must be some accounting for that because in human life terms and in economic terms, it's just astonishing. And the negligence involved in not doing that is just astonishing. And secondly, the failure to test and contact trace, uh, you know, has got to now become the very, very, very top of a kind of public emergency set of priorities because, you know, else we're, we're going to be having, you and I are going to be on this call again in, in October and, 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 you know, let's pray to God we're not. And then that makes, you know, we've got to hope that these wonderful Oxford, you know, rhesus monkeys are, you know, are our savior. And, my God, relying on that is, you know, you know. anyway, Peter, uh, our time has gone too fast, but very, very, very useful as always. I'm so, so grateful for your time. And um, 
I look forward to our next conversation. So stay safe and stay well. And thanks so much for your help and your expertise. Always a pleasure. Thank you. And thanks, everyone. Be safe. Bye-bye.